I'm Jerry. We may not have the money for a 30-second TV ad, but we're sure to make some of the best ice cream you ever tasted. And that was it. And uh, it really worked. Uh, you know, sales started taking off in Boston. And then we get this call from our distributor in Boston, uh, who says, uh, Ben, there's something really serious that's happened. Uh, I can't talk about it with you on the phone. Uh, we have to meet together in Boston in a place nobody's going to see us. So, you know, Jerry and I decide to show up. We go to the back room at some restaurant, and this distributor says, well, you know, I carry about 20 different brands of ice cream. Um, one of them is yours, and another one I've been carrying for a long time is haagen -Dazs. Well, haagen had just gotten bought by Pillsbury, and... Uh, the Pillsbury salespeople came to this distributor and said, if you continue to sell Ben and Jerry's, we're not going to sell you haagen anymore. And, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's was just starting off, and, you know, we didn't have near the sales that haagen had, and the distributor said, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry, I really like you guys, it's really good ice cream, but I'm going to have to drop it. And, uh, you know, we realized that, you know, if this was... If this could happen in Boston, this could happen with any major ice cream distributor around the country, and, you know, we wouldn't be get, able to get our ice cream onto the shelf, and we'd go out of business. And so, uh, you know, we saw a lawyer, and the lawyer said, well, it sounds like a restraint of trade under federal antitrust law that says that, you know, a country that, uh, a company that controls the major share of a given market can't keep other com companies out in the market. But... Uh, you know, you'd have to sue them, <laughs> and, you know, we weren't exactly in a position to sue Pillsbury. So uh, we decided that we would at, less, at least let the public know what was going on. And so we launched the What's the Doughboy Afraid of campaign. And uh, it began by renting aerial banners that flew behind planes that would circle the sports stadiums in Boston saying, what's the Doughboy afraid of? And uh, Jerry was a one-person picket outside the Pillsbury World Corporate Headquarters in Minneapolis. And uh, we held a uh, press conference in Boston and like one reporter showed up. And... We took out a, a little ad in the classified section in the back of Rolling Stone magazine that said, help two Vermont hippies fight the corporate giant, send in one dollar for a what's the doughboy afraid of bumper sticker. That didn't get that far. And, uh, and then we started thinking about it and we thought, well, who really cares if Ben and Jerry's goes out of business? And the answer was our customers. And so we started putting uh, stickers on the side of each one of our pints that said, what's the Doughboy afraid of, along with an 800 number. And we started getting like 100 calls a night on that call-in line, mostly between the hours of midnight and 3 a.m., uh, which apparently is when people are consuming our product. And, uh, and there would be a... Uh, uh, an answering machine. It was a tape one in the old days. Uh, and it would give the story of what Pillsbury was trying to do to us. And we asked people to leave their name and address for a Doughboy kit. And we would send them this kit that included a write-in letter to the Federal Trade Commission and a write-in letter to the chairman of the board of Pillsbury. Right. And uh, a what's the Doughboy afraid of bumper sticker for your car. And a chance to send in $10 and get a t-shirt that said uh, what's the Doughboy afraid of on the front and Ben and Jerry's legal defense fund major contributor on the back <laughs> and uh, 
you know, the the story started to be picked up by uh, the New Yorker magazine uh, by Calvin Truen, and then uh, the Boston Globe ran it, and the Hartford Current, and the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, and you know, eventually they were the doughboy was getting so much of a black eye that Pillsbury relented and allowed us to continue to distribute our ice cream. Yeah. But you know. That's the old days. Uh, you know, I want to talk about uh, what I'm doing these days, and I guess I want to start by talking about the three quotes that are painted in big letters on the walls of my office. The first one is, if we had justice, we wouldn't need charity. That's from Ralph Nader. And of course, he was talking about economic justice. If the global south were not being exploited by the global north, if multinational corporations and the wealthiest 1% were not rigging the system for their own benefit, if we truly had fairness and equality in our country in terms of quality of education for all, if we had universal health care, then we wouldn't need charity. And the other quote that's up there is only those who attempt the absurd achieve the impossible. What were some of those things that were impossible? Ending slavery, woman suffrage, getting electricity from the sun. And the third quote that's up there is, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. That's from Emma Goldman. Well, and as long as I'm quoting quotes, you know, there's one more. It's not up there, but it's one that I talk about uh, frequently. And that's a quote from uh, some German philosopher and it says, all truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. So that's the philosophy part. And now, what's Ben been doing? Well, before I get to that, there's another quote. Uh, well, I'll tell you what Ben's been doing. I mean, what, what have I been doing? Uh, what I've been doing has been uh, inspired by the work of Martin Luther King, who said that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And so... Uh, for, the, for 10 years after Ben & Jerry's got sold, I worked with a group of business people to try to shift national budget priorities away from unneeded Cold War era Pentagon expenditures and into social needs like education, healthcare, housing, yeah. feeding people. Uh, and as part of that, we formed an online organization called True Majority that's just now merged into U.S. Action. And so I was doing that, and then, uh, you know, just about a year ago, uh, the military-industrial complex uh, started coming home to roost in Burlington, Vermont, in the form of the F-35 which is uh, kind of the poster child for all that's wrong with the Pentagon. It's an overpriced, underperforming plane that was designed to defeat uh, the Soviet Union or another superpower like that, but, uh, you know, that's no longer needed in today's world. Uh, that F-35 is bad for our country because it puts us into debt. It's uh, the most expensive weapons 
system ever. It kills jobs because every billion dollars that you spend on the Pentagon creates half as many jobs as if you spent that billion dollars on education. It's bad for the military because it underperforms. I mean, the current uh, director of acquisition for the Pentagon has called the F-35 acquisition malpractice. Uh, and it's bad for Vermont because it would be located at a residential airport uh, in Burlington in the middle of a residential area. The noise blast is four times louder than the existing F-16s, and it puts 8,000 residents into an area that the FAA calls unsuitable for residential use. And the World Health Organization has said that 50% of the children living in that area will become cognitively impaired uh, due to those noise levels. And yet, uh, despite that, uh, the entire Vermont congressional delegation uh, is in support of basing that plane here. And according to an anonymous source at the Pentagon, the Air Force doesn't really want to base it here but they're only doing it because of extreme pressure from the delegation. So, you know, the, comment, the public comment period about the F-35 ends this coming Monday, uh, and I would encourage you all to visit one of the two websites that are working to keep this plane where it belongs, which is not here, uh, the websites are StopTheF35.com and uh, SaveOurSkiesVermont.org. Um, there's, there's an email form. You click on it. You tell them what you think, and you're done. Um, so this was all by way of introduction. We're now getting into the meat of the matter, uh, and the beginning of that is... Why is our country not run by solar and other renewable energy sources today? I mean, solar doesn't pollute. It's decentralized. It doesn't require the U.S. to overthrow democratically elected governments in the Middle East. It doesn't require wars for oil. It doesn't require a military force to protect shipping lanes. It's safe. It's free. Ah, there's the problem. You can't charge for it. And so huge corporations are not interested in it. Instead, the huge corporations are bribing politicians through so-called political donations to subsidize oil exploration indemnify the nuclear power industry, subsidize spent fuel nuclear storage facilities, and let the coal industry get away with highly polluting power plants. Meanwhile, other countries are subsidizing photovoltaic manufacturing, most solar panels are made overseas, and manufacturing jobs in the U.S. have disappeared. If the government had put one quarter of the money into solar R&D that they've put into fossil fuel and nuclear industries, solar would be the dominant form of energy in the U.S. today. I mean, geez. I mean, if you can do solar in Vermont, you can do it anywhere. So the issue is political campaign contributions otherwise known as legalized bribery. And the solution is getting money out of politics. You know, getting money out of politics probably has the broadest support of most anything in the United States. 80% of the population, that's Republicans and Democrats, all want to get money out of politics. They realize that it's money in politics that's destroying the democracy. And the reason why money is in politics is because of three Supreme Court rulings. The first one said, corporations are people. 
The second said that money is free speech. And the third, which was the most recent, Citizens United, put those t other two together and said, well, if corporations are people and money is free speech, then corporations can spend as much money as they want influencing uh, elections. And so the fact of the matter is that the only way to overturn those absurdities uh, is to amend the Constitution. Now, there are some people who have said that, uh, well, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, it may be a hard thing to do, but we've done hard things before. And uh, only those who attempt the absurd achieve the impossible. So this is a movement to amend the Constitution that is growing rapidly and gaining momentum. So far, there are 16 states, including Vermont, that have passed resolutions in favor of amending the Constitution to say that corporations are not people and money is not free speech. Uh, and, you know, there, there's kind of like a, a new state every, like, five or six weeks. Um, there's 500 municipalities that have voted in favor of that resolution. There's 20 senators uh, that have signed on to an amendment to get money out of politics. Bernie Sanders authored one of them. Uh, there's 100 congressmen that have signed on to an amendment to get money out of politics. And there's many organizations that are involved in this movement. Common Cause, People for the American Way, Public Citizen, Move to Amend, Free Speech for People, and now they've even been joined by the Sierra Club and Greenpeace because those two huge environmental organizations have come to realize that they're never going to get any of the environmental legislation passed that they need to until they can get money out of politics. It's the root cause of so many of our problems. So, uh, I'm involved in that movement uh, as part of the Stamp Stampede, uh, which is an effort to demonstrate ongoing, visible, accelerating, cumulative support from the American people for getting this amendment passed. And the medium that we're using to make our voice heard is money. We are literally making our money talk. You know, corporations and the 1%, they make their money talk by shoving gobs of it at politicians to get legislation passed that they want. We, who are not able to do that, can make our money talk by literally stamping messages on paper currency with rubber stamps. And the amazing thing about that is that it is truly viral marketing, but it's better than your typical internet viral marketing because it's in the real world and people are seeing it all the time. You know, when you put a stamp dollar bill into circulation, 875 people see it before that dollar bill is retired. Uh, so if you stamp uh, three or four bills a day uh, for a year and you take weekends off, your message will get out to a million people. And that's just one person. Uh, so our goal is to sell tens of thousands of rubber stamps, which we sell at our cost, uh, and encourage people to keep on stamping all the money that they run into and spread the word. Because the other wonderful thing about money is that it moves around the country. I mean, we here in Vermont, We've already passed the, the legislation about the, the resolution, but we can help spread the word by just stamping money. And it spreads and it moves. Um, so uh, it's actually, you know, usually 
the only thing that people can do to affect political change is to sign a petition or go to a protest or attend meetings or whatever. The beautiful thing about stamping money is that anybody can do it anytime, anywhere, with or on anybody. Uh, it's, it's an enjoyable pastime. When you're drinking at the bar, when you're hanging out with your family, uh, when you're waiting for your food at the restaurant, uh, when you're giving someone a tip, you make sure that it's uh, stamped. And the interesting thing about it is that it's, it's legal. Uh, you know, we've had, uh, you know, uh, legal uh, experts, uh, First Amendment experts look at this thing and, you know, you read the law and, uh, you know, the government assumes that people are going to mark money. And the law says, uh, well, you're, you're not allowed to cut the money. You can't put uh, holes in it. Uh, you can't uh, change the denomination. Uh, you can't make it so that it's no longer obviously money. And you can't glue it to other money. And you can't advertise your business on it. But other, other than that, it's cool. You can... You can stamp money. And, uh, and even though it is legal, it is kind of slightly subversive, and that makes it all the more fun. Uh, and, you know, so we kind of talk about it as a petition on steroids uh, or as economic jujitsu, using money to get money out of politics. Uh, so the flagship of the Stampede campaign which you can all visit online at stampstampede.org, but the flagship, the physical, three-dimensional, real-life flagship of the Stamp Stampede campaign is the amazing Amendomatic Stampmobile, which is here today and tomorrow at SolarFest. It is the only amazing Amendomatic Stampmobile that exists in the entire world, to the best of our knowledge, it is the only mobile money stamping machine in the entire world. It comes here to Tynmouth, Vermont, direct from standing room only engagements in Los Angeles, Phoenix, the Grand Canyon, Miami Beach, Washington, New York City, the Clearwater Festival where Pete Seeger himself came up to the stamp mobile and stamped his cash. Uh, so yes, I, I encourage, no, I implore you to step right up to the amazing Amendo Stampmobile tonight and uh, check out Corpo Man, the uh, gentleman in the uh, high hat who flips to one side as your money goes by and reveals that he is actually a corporate office tower. And you will thrill and amaze yourself to the amazing machinations of Money Mouth, who opens his mouth and attempts to speak with money. Uh, and you will also have the opportunity to meet the amazing Amendomatic impresario, the real-life, three-dimensional human, Aaron Rubin, at the Amendomatic Stantmobile, and he can uh, personally stamp your money. Uh, but the big news is that, you know, it is July, and this is the month during which our country was born. And so, uh, in honor of the birth of our nation, the entire month of July is Pay What You Can month at the Stamp Stampede. Now, as I said, these stamps, we sell them at our cost. It's a normal $10 price, which is a darn good value as it is because it's at our cost. And if you bought it online, there's an additional $5 shipping and handling, which again is our cost, but you know, that's 15 bucks. That's starting to get up to some significant dollars. But here, for the first time ever, anywhere, at SolarFest, it is pay what you can month live and in person right here there are 500 stamps on the amendomatic machine and you can name your price one dollar two dollar three dollar 
five dollars, six dollars. <laughs> you can, you can, you can even pay more than the ten dollar price. You know, twenty dollars. And you know, the idea is that you know those that have less pay less. Those that have more pay more. Maybe it'll even out. But it is pay what you can month, an incredible deal. And all you gotta do to be eligible for this amazing once in a lifetime promotion is to say the Stampers Pledge. Now the Stampers Pledge, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the whole Stampers Pledge and then I'm gonna go through it line by line and, and we can all say it together. It'll be really cool, this will also be a first. Uh, so here's the Stampers Pledge. I pledge to stamp a lot of money each day to build the movement to amend the Constitution, to get money out of politics, and preserve our democracy. One nation, uncorruptible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, now you all ready? Those who want to participate, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I pledge to stamp a lot of money each day to build the movement, to, build the movement. To, amend the to amend the Constitution, to get money out of politics, money out of politics. And, preserve our democracy. and preserve our democracy. One nation, One nation. Uncorruptible. uncorruptible, with liberty and justice, with liberty and justice. For, all. for all. All right, Woo! let's get stamping. Thanks a lot. So how does this work? You give me all your money. Yeah? <laughs> You're on camera now. Give me all your money and I stand before you with a message that says not to be used for robbing politicians. And when you spend I give it back to you, it doesn't cost you anything. And when you spend that money on average 850 people will see every bill that circulates through the economy. I can hand stamp it in a tenth of a second, but that wouldn't be any fun. I'll put it on a roller coaster instead. So give Sounds me all like your a plan. Give I got $40. Your, give me all your money. I will stamp it for you. Give it right back, and it will be adorned and beautified, and you'll get the message out. I just got $40 in people. small bills. Uh, well, not so right. small, but not so big. And you can buy a stamp for $10 or whatever you want to give us. There's self making stamps you buy at $10 for a thousand, we buy a thousand. We want everybody to have a stamp because this is the only stamp that we owe on earth. I can't stamp your money every day. I All can right. stamp it here. So we're gonna watch this process. I'm gonna put this on Organic Politics, our cable access TV show, which goes all over Vermont. Excellent. So and there it goes. Your naked ten dollar bill is where, about to be. Where is it? It's right here. Okay, here it is, okay. And which stamp do we get to choose the stamp, or is no, it? No, it says not to be used for bribing politicians. Yeah. It looks just like this. That means we can't. <laughs> let's, let's see, it went up there, there it goes. Takes a while. Time is money. Here it is, the most complicated way of doing the simplest dance <laughs> in the world, right? I want to see this guy's mouth come out. Do we have any more coming? Oh, we got a lot more coming. <laughs> his name is Money Mouth. And he, uh, his name is Money you, Mouth? He's, he's a rich white guy with way too much money. And he's a lobbyist and he's the one that brought politicians. You know what he's suffering from? Yeah, he's suffering from the belief that money is free speech when it is not. We call it, what about billionosis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I want to get his mouth.